Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. I am the Almighty Zentaco, as always, and today we're going to be learning how to make Simon Says. If you don't know what Simon Says is, check out this quick clip. Let's play Simon! Simon Says, come chase after me. Repeat my life sequentially. Okay, so that completely retarded thing from the 80s is Simon Says, and we're going to learn how to make that. So this is what it's going to look like when we are finished. Okay, so that is what our uh, game is going to look like. So the first thing we're going to need to do is right click and insert an object, throw in an active object, put it at the top of your frame, and this is just going to be a box that holds our variables, so we're going to call this var box. And this is going to need some variables, so we're actually going to need some strings for this. <clears throat> the concept is essentially what we're going to do is randomly generate a string that's going to be our target string, and then we're going to have the player press buttons and try to match that string. If they ever fail, then we, you know, we do the fail procedure and restart the whole thing. So we're going to need a couple things here. Let's call the first one target string, tar underscore string. And then current string. And the last one is going to be current wedge. And all current wedge is going to be is it's going to be the value of the currently uh, displaying or lit wedge. We're going to light up these wedges based on which one is currently the one that has been added. Okay, so we're also going to need some wedge objects. We're going to make these out of actives as is typical for almost anything in a fusion game. It is going to be an active, and we're going to call this wedge. So I'm going to go ahead and import art for my wedges. Be right back. Okay, so uh, create your wedges, or import them as I did, and set them up like so. Now, we are going to need to give these dudes a qualifier, so select them all, and we're going to go ahead and add a qualifier. So if you select multiple items, you can give them all a qualifier at once. We're going to do that. And you can obviously use any qualifier you want, just as long as it makes sense to you. I'm going to use generic one. We're also going to need to insert another active. This is going to be our start button, which we're going to have to click on to get things rolling. So let's name that start button. Okay, one last thing we need to do here is on all of these wedges, you need to give them another animation. So go ahead and copy your wedge. We're going to put it in walking. And what we're going to do is give it a lighter version of the color that it currently is. So for the green, I'm going to change it to a light green. And all this is is the animation that's going to play whenever the wedge is currently lit up. Okay, so we're going to start coding this now. So I apologize in advance. This might be a little bit complicated. But I think if you guys stick with it, uh, you can learn a thing or two and maybe modify this for your own purposes. Okay, so let's go ahead and throw in a new comment because it's always good to comment your code. And we're going to call this start the game. So whenever we click on the start button, so go to the mouse, <clears throat> user clicks on an object, single click with the left mouse, and that object is the start button. And we're also going to find out if it is visible. So go to visibility, is static buzz button visible? When that happens, we are going to make the static button invisible. So it goes away. And we are going to turn on a flag. We're going to put this flag, um, all of these flags, we're going to be using a lot of them for this. We're going to put them in var box. So the first flag, we're just going to do this sequentially, is going to be flag zero. So turn on flag zero. So we've set internal flag zero on. So let's add to the string. So whenever zero is on, so go to the var box, go to the flags. is flag on and that is flag zero. So whenever flag zero is on, we are going to change the alterable string. We're going to set target string. Okay. So what we're going to do is we want to add to it. And so 
depending on how many um, se sequences we've gone through, this string is gonna get bigger. So target string, we want that to equal the value of target string. So grab target string. And we're gonna add to this, uh, we're gonna add to this a random number. So like random four, because we have four chunks and then plus one because we don't want zero ever. <clears throat> so that'll give us a number between one and four. Now this won't work as a string because this is a value. So we need to convert this to a string and we can do that with the str dollar sign expression. So we can use the str dollar sign expression to convert a value to a string. Make sure though we put that value in parentheses and that value was random four plus one. So what this is gonna do is take the current string and it's going to add to it a random number between one and four. Okay, we're actually going to insert two other objects. We're gonna throw in some strings so that we can uh, keep tabs on what's happening and make sure that it does in fact work. So let's do that now. We'll add one string here and then we're gonna add another string. So the first string on top is going to be the value of the uh, of the current string value, which is the sequence that we're trying to get the player to match. And the second string is gonna be what, it's gonna display what the player has uh, pressed. So we're gonna try to see if these two things match up. If they ever do not match up, then we know that the player has failed. And then we can um, give him a fail sequence, a fail scenario. We'll call the top one string target and the bottom one string current. Current being the current player's input. So we're gonna set up an always event here that lets us see that. We are always gonna set this one here. We are going to change their multiple string and we're gonna make that the value of target string, which is under the var box. And then the second one here, I'm gonna drag this over and edit it because it's faster. And it's going to be the value of current string. Okay, so one last thing we need to do here is we need to turn off flag zero so that uh, it only gives us one new number added to the sequence because that's all we're gonna need each time the player attempts it. And, and Simon says you always add one new color to the sequence. So we're gonna do that through an always event and we're just gonna always turn off the flag zero. So set off flag zero. So if we run this now and press start, we see that we have generated one number. So that is what we wanna do currently. Um, one more thing we need to do, I forgot to do this, select all of the wedges and we need to add an alterable value. So click new and name it ID. These are gonna need an ID value. Okay, so give each of these manually an ID between one and four. Perfect. Now we're gonna to need to let the player click on these wedges and add to his current sequence value. So we will say player click on wedges. So we're gonna find out if the player has clicked with the mouse. Um, go to user clicks on an object, single click, and that object is going to be our group, which was generic one. So when that happens, we need to update the value of current string, which is the, uh, the, the player's input sequence. So go to multiple strings, set current string, and we're gonna set that to the value of current string. And we're gonna add, <clears throat> remember str dollar sign converts a value to a string. We're gonna add the value of the ID from our group of objects here, the generic one. So go to that, go to value, and select retrieve ID. Close off your parentheses. So the reason we're grabbing the value of current string and then adding this to it is because we wanna make sure we have the sequence thus far and then add the new input to it. So if this is the initial press, then it'll obviously be nothing and then we will just add the current ID. But if we've been doing this for a while, you'll get the entire sequence. Let's check it out. Okay, so let's press the buttons. There's two, 
one, four, three. So I can press these and as you see, they have their own sequence. Let's go ahead though and give them their animation when they get clicked on. We're gonna do that this way. Select all of these guys here and we're gonna give them a new value. We're gonna call it buffer. So when they're clicked on, uh, go to the group generic and set the alterable value of buffer to something like 30. <clears throat> and then we're going to animate it based on the buffer. So we will say if the alterable value of buffer is greater than zero, then we are going to change its animation to walking. Copy and paste it. We're going to edit this because this is faster. We're going to say if it equals zero, if the buffer value is zero, meaning that it is counted down and no longer needs to be highlighted. So we're going to change that animation sequence back to stopped, which was our default color animation. <clears throat> Forgot to do one thing. Uh, while the value of buffer is greater than zero, we need to count it down. So subtract one from buffer under that group of generic objects, which is the objects for our wedges. Okay, so it does work. I kind of think 30 is a bit long. So we're gonna tweak this and make it like 15. So now we need a win state. So let's add a new comment and call it success. <clears throat> so we will know that the player has achieved success whenever the value of the string, so we're gonna compare the string target string, whenever that equals the value of current string, or actually current string equals target string, it doesn't really matter. So whenever target string equals current string, they have matched up, and that means the player has inputted the, the proper sequence. Now, unfortunately, this will be true right off the bat when they're both nullified, so we need to add a stipulation, and that is that the button is invisible. Because whenever we press that button and get everything rolling, it's when it goes invisible, so that'll allow us to, uh, to check this after the sequence has been dished out and they will be different. This will not trigger at the very beginning now because we've added this is invisible. So once that happens, we want to go back and reinitiate the, uh, the sequence addition. Okay, that means we need to add another number to the sequence. And we did that by turning on alterable value or internal flag zero. So we want to do that. We want to say flag set on flag zero and also we want to clear the uh, the value of current string because we need to make sure that the, because every time you uh, have a sequence in Simon Says, it adds one to it and then you have to do the whole sequence again. And so the input we got from the player was stored in current string. We need to nullify that. And we'll do that this way, alterable string, set current string, and just use two quotation marks that will nullify it. Now we do not want the player to be able to uh, click the buttons unless the sequence has started. And we know the sequence has started when the start button is invisible. So go ahead and add that stipulation here. Find out if it is invisible, the start button, as well as if the player clicks on the, um, the buttons. So if we did this right and we hit the right button, it should add to the sequence. It did, now we got one one. I got one one four. We got 1143, 11433, three, three. so we messed it up, 11432, then we don't have a fail state yet, but you can see we failed because it didn't reinitialize. So let's add a fail state now, type in fail. Okay, so this is gonna be a little difficult, so uh, pay attention, here we go. So we are going to need to go to the special object and we're gonna compare two general values. Now what we're trying to do is we wanna find out if the value of current string, so grab that real quick. Uh, we wanna find out if it's the same as 
the target string, but only up to how long the current string is. Okay, so the problem here though is when you compare two general values, you can only compare values. You can't compare strings. So even though these strings are in uh, numeric format, or at least they're only holding numbers, they still are strings. But luckily you can convert a string to a variable or to a value, and you do that with the VAL condition. So put that in parentheses around there. So val current string of var box. So that's going to convert the value of current string to a or the string to a value. So uh, whatever the sequence is. Now we want to find out if that equals the value of, you've guessed it, target string. Now there is a problem with this because target string is going to have the entire sequence and as soon as you put in one number um, it's not going to match up even if it is the right initial number. So we want to only check the value of it comparative to the length of current string, okay? Because obviously we're not going to have anything inputted past that. So unless we do this, it'll always be wrong. So we do that with something called left. It's like this. And what left does is it takes a string and it gives you um, what is, it starts at the left and then you get to input a number. So you do a comma and then a number like that. And if we had, had it that way, that would uh, start at the left of our string and then it would give us one space over, which, you know, to the right. So it would be the leftmost part of the string. So this would just be the first character uh, starting. The, it would just be the leftmost character of the string. But we want to get it equal to the length of current string. So grab current string. Actually, sorry. Type in len. This is the length. This will give you the length of a string. Put a... Uh, a parentheses there and we're gonna grab the string value of current string close that off there okay now one final thing to do the, this is a string here we need to convert this to a value so we do that with val and put parentheses around it and yes I am aware that that is fairly complex so what this means, this is finding out if the current strings value is equal to the target strings value, equal but only uh, so many characters over as is the length of current string. And we also only want to do this whenever the button is invisible. So go to visibility, object is invisible. So this means we have failed. So when we fail, we want to nullify everything and start back over. So what we want to do then is make the button visible again. And we need to nullify both of those strings. So set uh, target string to null and set current string to null. I told you guys wrong, I steered you wrong. This needs to be different. We wanna find out if the value is different, not the same. If it was all the same, this would actually be uh, checking to see if it was correct. But we wanna make sure that it is different because then that means we failed. Let's check it out. Let's find out if it works. Click start, we need to press one, boom. Now we need to press one, two, one, two. Now one, two, two, one, two, two. One, two, two, four, one, two, two, four. One, two, two, four, one, let's mess it up. One, two, two, four, two. And it ended. So um, this is essentially done. The only problem is we don't have any sound, which we're gonna need to add, and we do not have the uh, animations. Okay, so we need to go ahead and animate the wedges. So we need to get that rolling. And we want that to start whenever we uh, have also, or whenever we finished generating our new sequence. So that was here on line four. And we want to set on, we're just gonna use a flag. We'll set on flag one. So whenever flag one is on, that's when we're gonna do our animation sequence. So the first thing we wanna do down here for animate wedges is find out is flag one on. And when that's true, um, then we want to get the current wedge value. Okay, so now we're gonna to need to grab the value of the current wedge. And by that, I mean, um, here, I'll show you. Let's say we're playing the game and we got, let's say we got here. 
uh, if we now if we want to read this sequence, like starting at the beginning, the current wedge is gonna we're gonna need to move through them. Uh, so we need to be wedge one, then two, then two, then four. But this is you know obviously a string of four characters, so we need to be able to get each of these wedges in sequence. And we just want that single number. We don't want any other number in that sequence. Just that last number, that is the current value. And we're going to do that um, by going through a count. So we're going to need to add a new variable here. So click on the var box and add new. And we're going to call it count. And this is what we're going to use to count through our uh, sequence. Okay, so whenever the internal flag one is on, then we want to get the value of the current wedge. So we'll do that this way. We want to go to our var box and set the string of current wedge. And current wedge needs to be, this is a little complicated. Uh, we want left dollar sign. We want to grab the value of target string. So grab the target string. And then we want to get it to the length of count because count is going to run for uh, it's going to it's going to count up each time we grab a new uh, a new number here. So get the value of count. Put this in parentheses. But we only want the the last number in the sequence. So we're going to grab right. It does the opposite of left. So type in right dollar sign. Put it in parentheses. We need a comma. We only want the last one. So that's comma one and then close it off. And I know this looks like like absolute like arcane gibberish, uh, like a bunch of gobbledygook, but you know, if you if you sit down and think about it and parse it out, it does make sense. And I actually recommend that you guys do that. Take a piece of paper, write out a string, and then apply this mentally to it and see if you can understand what's happening. Because I know it's scary, but it's really useful and I do think you can understand it. So we got, need to go ahead and count this up then. So we're going to do that this way. We're going to find out if the value of count is different than the length of our target string. Which means as long as the target string, uh, as long as that we have not counted up through the entire string, it's going to keep going about its business and running this algorithm, I guess you could call it. It's not really an algorithm, but you know, it'll, it'll keep doing what it's doing. And again, we only want to do this when internal flag one is on. And also we don't want it to count up right away. We want it to be slowly uh, over, over time. And we want that to happen every, whoops, uh, every so often. So we're going to say like every 30 seconds or something or, or 50 milliseconds. I don't know, something like that. Just go to the timer object and say every, and uh, we'll say, 50 and we can modify this obviously um, till we get a feel we like but 50 is half a second so every time this happens we want to add one to count okay so we have changed the value of current wedge and we've counted up okay so now we want to actually do something to the current wedge that's why we have the current wedge value so we're gonna do that this way we're gonna find out if the alterable value for our group uh, which holds our wedges, which is the generic group one, we're going to find out if the ID equals the value of current wedge, meaning that this is the current wedge that has been scoped, you could say. It is the current wedge. It is the, the, That number represents, uh, that number in the sequence represents this wedge, so this is the wedge we want to animate. So we will find out the value of current wedge. Now, because this is a value, this cannot be a string, we need to convert this like so. So if this happens, then uh, what, what we've done here, then we've scoped the appropriate wedge that is the current wedge, the one that is currently being run through the count. And when that happens, we want to give that wedge uh, a color and we want to animate it. Um, you know, we're going to need to animate it so it lights up. We're going to do that by what we did before, which was uh, giving it the buffer value. So we will do that now. We will set buffer to like 15. We need to do a couple more things down here. So insert something else here. Go to the var box. We want to find out if the alterable value of count is greater than zero. And the reason we're doing this is because initially the count value, which is going to be zero initially, is going to equal the length of target string at the very beginning. And so it will turn everything off 
and kind of jack up what we want uh, going on. And so this makes sure that doesn't happen until the count has actually initiated and got, gotten underway. So we know that the count has finished, not that it hasn't started. Okay, um, also we made a mistake here. Go ahead and take a look at this. Um, <clears throat> we want to actually set this to the value here of count plus one. So add a one in there. Okay, um, so we're gonna every 50 seconds we're gonna do this, blah 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 blah. Okay, we want to also play a sound effect. Let's go ahead and do that. Whenever internal flag one is on, add one to count. Um, every 50, yeah, we're gonna right here we're gonna play a sample, and I'm gonna make it something called tone. Let's take a look and see if this worked. Okay, that's a little confusing because we have more than one flashing at a time. So we're gonna find out if the alterable value for uh, our wedges, which remember is group generic one, we're gonna find out if ID is different than the value of the current wedge, which is a string, remember? So grab the current wedge and it needs to be converted to a value. So type in val and put it in parentheses. And if it's different, then we're going to go ahead and set that animation. Or actually, we'll just set the uh, buffer value to zero, which will turn the animation off. One more thing, we need to add another stipulation here. We want to find out if, uh, if a certain flag is on. That is flag one, because flag one is the sequence for animating them. We don't want that stipulation to apply when we're clicking, okay, which is when flag two is on. So we're gonna make sure that flag one is on here. So go to flags, is flag on. And I realize this is a little confusing with all these different flags, but it probably is the best way to do this. Okay, so make sure this says internal flag one is on. And also we'll go ahead and throw this up here in line 18 as well because we do wanna make sure this, this uh, animation is only applying to whenever we are going through the animation sequence. So uh, whenever it is the current value, then we want the buffer to be 15. Whenever it is not the current value, we wanna set that buffer to zero, essentially turning it off. The this is, uh, buffer of zero will be turning the animation off. Anything greater than zero will be giving us the animation. And keep in mind that line 20 is making it flash. Let's check it out. Okay, I would say that's much better. Uh, the only thing we need to do now is add um, a modulation to the sound effects. So we make sure that each one of these nodes has their own sound effect. We're gonna do that this way. Go to sample. We are going to set a channel frequency. We're gonna use channel 32, because why not? Frequency is gonna be 20,000 multiplied by vowel parentheses. Grab the value of the string current wedge. So we're getting the value of current wedge. So that means every wedge, which is number one through four, is gonna have a specific and different frequency, starting at 20,000, then 40,000, so on, so forth. Then we gotta play a sample. Go to samples, play sample on a specific channel. That was tone, and the sample, or the channel is 32. Um, I think we wanna actually play the sample before the channel change. Let's find out. Yep. One last thing though, we would like to probably add some sound for when we click. So we will do that this way. We will just uh, just drag this on up to whenever we click 
here. Okay, so we want to edit this. So we want to uh, edit where it says set the frequency. And we just want to set the frequency of channel 32 to 20,000. 20,000, yep. And we're going to multiply that. Now, instead of by the current wedge, um, we're going to use the value of ID from our... Uh, wedge group of events and that's because we've clicked on it which means it is currently scoped so we can use it now so we'll go to values and then grab ID let's see if that works So as you see, this does indeed work. This is Simon Says on Click Team Fusion 2.5. Uh, you could add some more stuff to this, like a running counter for how many times you've clicked it, and then you know give you a best of, so you can have a high score to beat, which that's really easy. I think you guys can figure that out. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them down below, and I will try to get back to you, uh, or maybe meet me in my Discord channel, and I will, me or someone else will be available to help you out with anything you might be struggling with. So as always, guys, uh, thank you for watching. I'm sorry this was a hard one. I hope you understood it. Okay, well, I will see you guys in the next video. Until then, have a fantastic day. Let's play Simon! Simon says, come chase after me. Repeat my life sequentially. Do da do what I do da do. Simon says I'll give you the rest if you don't keep up with all my jazz. So don't da do what I don't da do. Simon says go longer and faster, and when you do, you'll be the master. You did da do what I did da do. Simon, the do what I do computer game from MB Electronics. <laughs>